we'll uh, switch switch gears here a moment. Comment uh, and a question. Several of us at this meeting, six or seven, have had bendamustine with or without rituxan. All uh, report very positive results. Will bendamustine become the next rituximab, that is, standard of care? But Kurt, you want to start that one? Like so many of these questions, <clears throat> like Velchain, like Brad001, like cyclophosphamide, like rituxan, <clears throat> bendamustine is a highly active agent in the management of global forms of macroglobulinemia, for that matter, as a stem cell transplantation. And the dilemma that we all face is what's the correct sequencing, what's the right combination, and this is something that we continue to struggle with in clinical trials, as to whether it's two agents, or three agents, or four agents, and what the correct sequence is. I know that bendamustine is not only active, but the tolerance is relatively good, but I'm not able to answer whether bendamustine is the current first-line management, second-line management tool, whether it's best combined with Velcate or Cytoxin or just Rituxin or single agent. Uh, I just don't think I can answer that question, and I suspect there are individual patient factors that would actually uh, have to be taken into account before any type of appropriate decision could be made. Just one more addition is that uh, we actually don't know the, how many cycles to give. And I think the more cycles we give, the uh, more likely that we're going to induce some uh, damage to the normal stem cells in the bone marrow and maybe the immune system. So we need to care, be careful with the number of cycles also. So just to add a few comments about uh, bendamustine, I think all of us have been uh, quite inspired in it and uh, impressed by this uh, oldest new drug that's now in our arsenal. And uh, just to keep in mind, when uh, we had met, uh, I think over 10 years ago in, uh, in St. Louis, and we were talking about you know, treatment options, just, just to now reflect back on how few we had back then compared to what we have now. And so this is actually a moment to celebrate because we have a lot of choices. The nice thing is that we can actually now talk about individualized uh, therapy for patients based on individual considerations. So I actually look at this now retrospectively with 10 years of experience here, we've really moved ahead. We can now have discussions about options, you know, what's the appropriate option for a patient. Now the one thing I will say about bendamustine, it may be the oldest new drug that we have in our arsenal, but that doesn't mean we have a lot of knowledge about this drug, particularly long-term impact on patients. Because these Germans weren't very good at keeping notes, or if they did, you know, people uh, were skeptical. And so quite frankly, when you look at the long-term outcome of these drugs, you know, the longest experience that's out there is three years long. It was reported last year at uh, the American Society of Hematology by both the Germans as well as uh, the Americans looking at their series and looking at secondary uh, side effects. <clears throat> because I serve on the Global Steering Committee for this drug, I'll tell you we've really pushed hard with the company to be able to look at long-term impact and long-term <coughs> cancer risk uh, with this drug. So far, there are no signals, but that doesn't mean that if more time goes by, we won't see it. That may be also true of a lot of other agents that we commonly use. So in our practice, much like I think uh, Maury and Rafid also uh, acknowledged, you know, we're very selective. For the younger patient, we'll try to avoid. Now, what does younger mean? As we get older, younger means that you guys are being, you know, younger. Um, but, um, you know, we reflect back on the individual patient. And we don't want to risk, you know, individuals, you know, unnecessarily without having that long-term knowledge. But having said that, you know, patients who come in with a lot of disease, particularly if they have you know, big lymph nodes or big spleen, uh, or they've already been through therapy and their disease has relapsed, we, we genuinely found bendamustine to be among the best of agents that we can use for these patients. Just one, uh, regarding cost, it's an old drug, but uh, each dose, the charge for each dose is $25,000 administration of the drug. So, Two days in a row, that's a $50,000 charge. I mean, obviously, your insurance company will negotiate the price, but that's expensive. $25,000? $25,000. I was surprised when one of my patients showed me that. I'm amazed. Uh, Dr. Rummels tells me, I asked Dr. Rummels in Germany, 
and he says it costs him seven hundred dollars uh, an injection. So that the vial costs seventeen hundred dollars. So seven hundred dollars. How does that get to twenty five thousand? <laughs> The charge for bendamustine, uh, which has been you know, vetted out in a number of institutions, is about forty thousand dollars per course. Now, it doesn't again, you know, these are big numbers, and thankfully, insurance has picked up in many of these circumstances these charges. But uh, I, I, you know, twenty five thousand dollars a dose. I don't know what, what you're administering at your hospitals. <laughs> I can remind you that bendamustine was developed because. East Germany was unable to afford nitrogen mustard. Bob, if I can ask you a politically sensitive question of my colleagues. As the drug comes off label and the company becomes less excited about <coughs> maintaining the drug, is the IWMF going to be forced to purchase this drug as an orphan agent? <laughs> well, I don't think so. <laughs> We have to uh, we have to consult uh, the uh, IWMF on that point. But, uh, <laughs> I, I, just want, I just want to also uh, add perhaps another development along the same lines, and that is that Teva, an Israeli pharmaceutical, just recently purchased um, a Cephalon, and in fact their strength is that they make generic drugs. So I think what you're going to see ultimately over time is uh, as this becomes a generic, the cost should come down, just like it has for numerous other agents as well. Okay, uh, can you recommend a standard uh, risk of laboratory tests for a patient at each follow-up visit? Well, I don't, I, we haven't standardized in Rochester, but I do think there is, it's a permissible to have individual variability. But I will tell you that at every visit, I do obtain a serum protein electrophoresis and an IGF every visit because every cycle of therapy, I'd like to know where things are. And I found, at least in some of my referral base, uh, that I'll do a few cycles of therapy and then assess. And, uh, and that's, I'm not comfortable with that. I like to know every visit, so I always do that. Since anemia is such a common problem with this disease, it's a really key endpoint. So that's obviously part of it, as is monitoring the white cell plate account because there you're monitoring the toxicity of your therapy. Then it gets a little bit iffy. I don't routinely do a free light chain with every patient with Waldenstrom's. I use some degree of selectivity. Things I don't do with every visit are the serum beta to microglobulin, which I think is incredibly valuable as a prognostic factor, but I don't think is useful as useful in the monitoring of the disease. For some selected patients, I do a 24-hour urine protein electrophoresis as well. There are some of you out there that may need cryoglobulin checks or viscosity checks, which are not general tests for each visit, but may be appropriate for a given individual. And then within that, the question is, who needs their potassium check, those who take diuretics? Monitoring renal function, which can sometimes affect the dosing of some of the chemotherapy. Monitoring of liver function, which sometimes can affect the dosing as a monitor for toxicity. Those are not absolutely essential for every single patient, every single dose, but that's why you see a specialist who can make those judgments. Sorry, so. Morty, can I just ask you to continue that? Uh, in your MGUS or your Waldenstrom's patients with neuropathic difficulties, what do you add to the list? I don't think there's anything better than uh, a careful questioning of the patient and a careful physical examination. And in fact, of course, in that situation, my competencies are a bit limited, so we will partner with our neurologists. As you know, Peter Dick and his group in the Neural Disability Score for us is very helpful understanding where those are going. But to be honest, that type of a measurement is simply beyond my capacity and requires partnering. Yeah, along those same lines, um, uh, Fred, we, we have looked at serial anti-mag and GM1 in those patients that are positive. And 
I really haven't found it to be informative in terms of being able to assess whether somebody's uh, neuropathy is improving or not. The, the IgM, ideally, you want to see going, going in the right direction, but just because an IgM goes down, as you well reminded us, uh, doesn't necessarily mean that the patient's uh, underlying uh, neuropathy is uh, improving. The only other point that I think uh, is worth mentioning is you know, do we repeat bone marrow biopsies and CAT scans in individuals? And I think, you know, when you need guidance to know, you know, how, how much the therapy has succeeded and uh, in some cases whether to discern if a patient is really responding or not, um, a bone marrow biopsy could also be helpful in adding to the list that, uh, that uh, Maury already spoke about. And CAT scans, you know, about 15% of all patients with Waldenstrom's will have disease, you know, outside of the bone marrow. And, here too, I think, you know, once a, a course of therapy has been completed, a good assessment by CT scanning uh, could be helpful as well. I would uh, probably would just add that, uh, that uh, routine checking of the bone marrow and uh, CT scanning is uh, not uh, necessary uh, unless there are some uh, uh, real reasons to do this. However, uh, both of these tests are useful when you start your therapy uh, so that you have a good solid baseline and then eventually when treatment is completed, you can uh, uh, compare the before and after the test. It is probably, uh, I, I prefer to do both. The Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia consensus panel recommended measuring the protein with serum protein electrophoresis as the first choice. But there is a, uh, in our laboratory, there is about an 8% variation in the result of the serum protein electrophoresis and also a similar uh, difference in measuring the monoclonal IgM level. So I think ideally it is best to do both tests. The other point I would emphasize is that you as patients uh, should not get excited with modest changes in either of these values. What you want to see is a trend are your values increasing or are they decreasing? And don't take a lot of, uh, don't be concerned about a single uh, uh, result because laboratories can vary more than that 8%. Thank you.